Hello, in this video I'm going to introduce a new tool for learning Git. Um, it's a Git simulator. It's a lot like Python Tutor um, for Git. And so if you go to my website under Tools, um, you can go to the Git simulator. And um, I, I made some changes to it, kind of simplified it a bit. You can see over here on the, on the left-hand side, there's this link that says Original. If you want to, you can go there. And, um, and then if I scroll down a bit, they have... Um, uh, they have the application here. So this is kind of the original version. And in this version, they have these tutorials and you're welcome to do that. Um, I'm just gonna have the simple sandbox version on my site uh, that you can play with and, and, and do, do labs in. And I, and I might have like other questions based on this, say on the, on the weekly quizzes. Um, so here I am, you can see that I have, um, on the right-hand side, I have these two commits already, uh, commit zero and commit one. I have this thing called the master branch that I'm gonna be talking about more. And uh, let's uh, first try to create a new commit. And if we were doing this, uh, if we were doing this, say, um, you know, in an actual environment, there would be three steps here. The first thing we would have to do is we might have to edit a file, right? And so you can see this fake terminal here on the left that I'm going to be running commands in. And so I might do something like emacs file.txt, or, um, or the one we've learned is nano file.txt and it turns out that since this is a simulator it's not going to do all of these things but this would be the first step right i'd edit the file uh, and make some changes um, the next step towards making a commit is that i would have to say i want to track that file right so i've edited the file and now i want to track the file so i would say get add file.txt and this is something i would do every time i wanted to record changes to the file in a new commit and that also is not part of the simulator, right? So I want you to remember those two pieces, um, even though I'm not gonna usually be doing them. Okay, uh, so first we edit, second we add, and then third, we actually can commit. So after I've done those, I could say get, commit, and, uh, and then I would normally put a message here, uh, which would say what I was changing. And maybe I'll say uh, change file.txt. Uh, now it turns out that these messages are also not part of the simulator, right? So I'm gonna get rid of that and I'll just do get commit here. So I do that and you see that I get this new commit C2 um, and you can see that the master branch is now referring um, to that. So also notice, remember before when we were using real get, um, the commit numbers were awful, right? They were these hexadecimal numbers that were really long. So by hexadecimal, I mean, they didn't just contain the digits zero through nine, but they also contained uh, letters A through F um, for uh, to basically, are, which are digits for 10 through 15. And so here is just C0, C1, C2, so a little bit simpler in that regard as well. Okay, so you can see that I can do um, a commit like that. And, and again, right, since this is just a simplification, if I run commit a second time, it will do it without having me do the first and second steps that are normally so important. Okay, so I, I can commit just like that. Now, if I want to, I can switch um, which commit I'm on. And there's kind of two ways that it might show which commit I'm on. Um, one is you can see that after the name master, there's this little star, right? That means I'm currently on the master branch and the master branch is currently on commit three. Uh, therefore, I'm on commit three. If I want to change to a different one, I can do this. I can say get checkout C1. And it's going to draw uh, kind of the fact that I'm looking at that a little bit differently. It's going to create this arrow um, that says head, right? And so the head is basically pointing to whatever I'm looking at. And so if I wanted to, I could do to check out C2, and now I'm looking at that. And when this head is looking directly at a commit without going through a branch, that's what we call headless mode. So it's a very normal thing to do when I'm trying to go back in history. Now, uh, there's another way I can be headless mode that's a little bit strange, and that's if I do get checkout, get checkout C3. Okay, um, now I'm in headless mode even though this um, this uh, commit has this branch associated with it, right? So get checkout C3 would be different than saying get checkout master. When I do that, I just hit that star. And, and really the way you should think of that star is that the head is pointing to the master. Okay, so I can, I can be in either of these modes. And so why does that matter? So, so as we saw before, when I'm uh, attached to a branch and I commit, it moves along with me. If I say do get checkout C4, 
Now I'm in headless mode. And if I do a new commit, what you're gonna see is that the master branch didn't keep up with me. And I actually get this little warning that I'm, um, I'm in a detached head state, right? And, and so generally, um, kind of being in a headless state is fine if I wanna view, um, view older commits, but it's not something I would really do typically um, if I was trying to make new commits. And, and, and the reason why is this, if I do get checkout master now again, um, you can kind of see that they are drawing uh, this commit a little bit lighter. It's almost like a ghost, right? And uh, there's two reasons for that. One is that it's going to be hard for me to get back there. It doesn't have a nice name anymore. I would have to remember what that commit number is. And second, uh, kind of if you run some cleanup tools later, uh, it will delete that C5. What It actually has a name. It's an unreachable commit because there's no branch that kind of points to it or, or any commits coming after it. Right? It's unreachable and, um, and it'll kind of get deleted if I run these cleanup tools later, right? So that's not really something I would want to do very often. Um, okay, so let's do this. I'm gonna, I've been talking about the master branch. Um, I can create um, other other branches, right? So I could say uh, get branch, and then I can give my branch a new name. So I'm gonna call this branch test. And, um, and so you can see that's there. I'm gonna do another one, get branch. Uh, maybe I'll call this one bug fix like that. And so I could have all of these different branches that are, are kind of pointing to the same commit and that's totally fine thing um, to do. Um, I could also create tags, right? I can say get tag, uh, I guess I'll just call this um, tag one. And I can see that that's associated, it looks a little bit different. And, and so there's a lot of ways I can be referring to um, C4 right now. I could, I'm currently on the master branch that's referring to it, but I can say get checkout bug fix, right? And you can see that the little arrow refers to bug fix now. Um, if I say get checkout T1, uh, oh, get checkout tag one, you see that that's basically like going to headless mode, right? Um, the head can point directly to a commit or it can point to a branch referring to a commit but it cannot refer directly to a tag. Right? When I say get checkout tag one, that's just a shorthand for saying uh, get checkout C4, okay? So, so let me do this. I'm gonna head back to uh, get checkout bug fix. And so that's the branch I'm currently on, right? So head is referring to bug fix. And so what this means is that when I do a get commit, that is the only branch that's trying to move along. Right, so bug fix is going to refer to my new branch C5, whereas master and test uh, get left behind, right? And so I could do another one if I wanted to. I could do a get commit. All right, so I kind of have this new chain. Uh, now, if I go back to say test, get checkout test, I can do some commits here as well. Get commit, get commit. And what I want you to notice here is that this is why we call these branches, right? This branching feature where I can use this branch label allows me to split off history into kind of different branches of a tree, okay? Now, eventually, right? I mean, the main version of the code is in the master branch, right? So I can go back here, hit checkout master. And, you know, I've made these two different changes, right? I've, I've kind of add, added some tests and I've done this bug fix. And I eventually want these additional features to be part of the main version, which is kind of a little bit uh, lagging now. It's lagging behind everything else. And the way I can do that is with a merge, right? So if I say get merge and I say test, what I'm saying is that everything on the test branch should now be part of my master branch. And what that's trying to look like is that the master branch is just trying to kind of run down that right chain of the tree until it catches up. Okay, so that's one type of merge, right? I can, uh, you can see it actually says over here on the right-hand side, it's fast forwarding, right? I'm kind of catching up to these uh, later changes that have been made on a different uh, branch. Um, one aside here that sometimes people asked about is they say, well, what are the colors of these uh, different commits mean, right? You can see that it changed colors and it means nothing. It just makes the simulator a little bit prettier. So don't worry about uh, matching the colors, um, especially if you're trying to reproduce what I'm doing. It might be random, for example. Okay, so I, I did kind of a fast forward merge, but what about bug fix? How can I kind of pull in all of those features, 
right? I've made some some improvements on test, which I've already incorporated into master, made other improvements on bug fix. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to say get merge bug fix. And now we can't fast forward. What we actually have to do is make a brand new commit called a merge commit that kind of pulls in all the features at the same time. So I'm going to do that. And, and now I have this C10 that really has two uh, parents, right? It kind of has two predecessors in, in terms of the history and it's trying to have all those features together. Now in the simulator, it was almost deceptively um, simple, right? It's not always easy to combine two different people's changes into the same thing, right? I mean, maybe, um, maybe somebody on one branch was adding additional calls to a function and maybe uh, somebody else's changes were renaming that function, right? So more calls to a function than renaming the function. So the person making additional calls was probably using the old name and, and it kind of takes some cleverness to realize, well, how can we uh, kind of incorporate all of these changes in, in a reasonable way? And if we're talking about Python code, well, any tool that kind of automatically merges these needs to understand Python code. Um, if we're writing a paper, um, heaven forbid, then this merge tool needs to understand the English language and how it can do, kind of do grammatically correct things and merge in multiple authors' works. So it looks really simple here, and sometimes it is, sometimes it gets into it automatically, but oftentimes there's going to be these merge conflicts, and, and Jit will say, I don't know how to combine that. And then you, as the as kind of the user, has to do a lot of work to say, well, here's what it looks like to combine these two different things. And that can actually be quite a lot of work. That's like the worst thing that happens um, happens when you're using when you're using get. Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to be um, demonstrating that. I'm going to create an actual merge conflict in, in, a, in a real Git repository and then demonstrate this problem.